Well, good morning. Welcome to the Alaska House Majority Coalition's Press Availability. Joining me today to my left is Representative Ivy Sponholtz, our Chair of uh, Health and Social Services uh, from District 16. Uh, to my right, Representative Josephson, who is uh, our Co-Chair of Resources and is from District 17. And then next to him, our other Co-Chair of Resources, Representative Garen Tarr from District 19. All four of us uh, representing parts of uh, the Anchorage area. Um, today is day 22nd of the 90-day session. We have 60 days left. Uh, in hopes of getting out of here in 90 days, we have a separate appropriation for education on the floor tomorrow in third reading. We hope the House minority will join us with their three-quarter vote to get that tough vote out of the way early um, so that we can early fund education and guarantee a component of the budget that we all agree on that's very important to Alaska. In the last few days, we have seen a downward crash in the markets, a record 1,100 points yesterday after losing about 660 points or 668 points on Friday. The Asian markets are down. China has crashed. However, just a moment ago, we see in the press that uh, it's popped up about another 350 points. So it's taking us down from 9% uh, uh, because, you know, when you get down to 10%, it's basically a crash. So we're right there on the verge and we're able to bounce back up a little bit. Uh, but it all shows that the Senate majority does need to open their eyes and realize the economic situation Alaska's in and the volatility of our markets and, and knowing that grabbing at the permanent fund is uh, not a sustainable plan. We have to do more for Alaska. Uh, this week we also have members from the Alaska Geri uh, Geriatric Exchange Network, AgeNet, uh, who are walking the buildings advocating for uh, our seniors. And we also hope that the Senate will refrain from any types of cuts to education or to senior centers or pioneer homes. Our children and our seniors are our most vulnerable, and the Alaska House Majority Coalition will stand up for them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Josephson. Thank you, Leader Tuck. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm excited about tomorrow. I'm excited about the idea of early funding education. This is not something that you've seen. Uh, it has been something that has dragged on and pushed up to that May 1 statutory requirement to uh, pink slip folks. And we think this is unnecessary. We think we can do better than this. And uh, as a public school teacher myself, I'm proud that, to tell you that I just uh, renewed my certificate last year. I've had it since 1991. Uh, I taught in the bush for three years. I know that the impacts are there when um, school districts needlessly, but understandably, have to restructure their budgets and make tough decisions that they then have to retract. And what happens is teachers then say, enough of this. We're going to pick another state. We, we love teaching, but we're not going to tolerate this, and we lose talent as a consequence. So I'm very excited about tomorrow's vote uh, on House Bill 287. I want to mention that uh, the University of Alaska subcommittee has been meeting. Uh, I am an alternate on that committee. I've been sitting on that committee. I'll sit on it today. And um, the UAA is in my district in Midtown Anchorage. I'm a graduate of UAA. I support the region's uh, recommended increase. Um, some may say that that's unaffordable. We think that it, it's important to help leverage uh, other dollars and to keep a strong university going. Um, and uh, we think that with a fiscal plan, that can be done. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to be supporting increases in every budget, but the university has been cut and cut dramatically. It's been cut $61 million since 2014. The total over a three-year span is approaching $200 million. And we're seeing the impacts on students and on the institution itself. So I'm going to take a tough position relative to my support of the university. I want to talk very briefly, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Representative Spunholtz, about uh, Representative Lincoln. Um, it's great to have him on the Resources Committee. Co-Chair Tar and I made the decision to make him our vice chair. That was a sign of our confidence in his in intellect and hardworking approach. Um, we think that he has the right background to help us run that committee. And we know how important House District 40 is to our economy. He's going to uh, bring a new, uh, some, give us some insights and offer uh, a real uh, help to us on that committee. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Representative Sponholtz. 
Thanks, uh, Representative Tuck. So uh, I too am pretty excited about uh, having uh, House Bill 287 on the floor tomorrow. It builds on the priority of every member of our coalition uh, to ensure that uh, great uh, that children have great schools uh, staffed with skilled teachers. Um, we can easily remove the budget uncertainty that our state is facing by passing this standalone bill. Um, it takes the guesswork out of our public education system, and it's aligned both with the governor's budget and uh, in that it, it's not an increase to funding. We understand these are tough fiscal times, uh, but what it does is give stability. It also aligns with the Senate in Senate uh, Bill 131 uh, introduced by uh, Gary Stevens, which uh, seeks to forward fund education. So um, we think that there's enough alignment here that we can uh, make some progress. Uh, we want to just end the, the pink strip drama that uh, for our teachers, giving them a little more stability. Um, there's, a, there's an important note, too, about our funding mechanism. Some people have asked why it is that we would use the CBR uh, to fund uh, to fund our education budget rather than the earnings reserve. The CBR requires a two-thirds vote. Well, there's a really good answer for that, and that is that the CBR earns, because it's very conservatively invested, so we have good cash flow, it's very, it only earns about 1.5%, or it earned about 1.5% last year, whereas the earnings reserve, um, because it's designed to be a long-term investment uh, fund, which is invested a lot more aggressively, earned almost 13% last year. If we're going to try to spend money from savings, we should spend the money that's earning the less for us so we can get the maximum return on investment from our resources. Um, you know, I also want to uh, talk a little bit, I want to touch on the, um, the seniors, uh, the age net folks that are in town here. Um, as we're looking at, you know, the various issues that our state is facing, our economy is really struggling, um, and those amongst us that are most vulnerable are struggling. Um, we want to make sure that uh, that our seniors that are on the edge continue to be able to uh, to do well. And that's why we're going to be uh, hearing uh, Scott Kawasaki's bill on extending the senior benefits program this afternoon and HESS, and we look forward to hearing testimony from people throughout the state on that important bill. Um, uh, and uh, and we need to be mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, if we don't come up with strong, sustainable fiscal solutions for our state, we're going to continue to stress our economy, and that has big down or has big upward pressure on our budget. Uh, you know, I looked up a couple of numbers recently. We have 30,000 additional people enrolled on food stamps in the last year. That's a very important you know, current metric of poverty in our state. The people, the number of people enrolled in our Medicaid population has got up. It's not just the, the expansion population, it's also the traditional population. Since 2015, we have 32,000 more people in that traditional population that are on Medicaid. And these are not people that, um, these are not people that aren't working. Three quarters of people on Medicaid are working. And those that aren't working are usually, uh, they have a disability, they're taking care of a loved one or their family, they're retired, um, they have a very good reason for not working. Um, so if we don't get a handle on our fiscal situation, what we're going to see is increased growth in our budget in Medicaid and food stamps and all of the kinds of support programs that you have to put in place to make sure that, we, to make sure that people uh, don't starve. Uh, it's a, this is a, a tough time, and I think we have some tough decisions to make. Thank you, Representative Sponholz. Representative Tarr. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage. And um, I want to thank my colleagues for um, those, those beginning comments, because it really sets up where, where I want to go with my opening comments in terms of you know, reminding folks about our four-pillar fiscal plan, what we set out to accomplish last year. And, um, you know, that included the broad-based measure. It included protection of the PFD and the POMV. It includes the strategic cuts, and it also included the oil tax reform. Um, you know, what we've been told by our Senate colleagues is that the broad-based measures are off the table. Um, that's why that's, you know, focused is in again on the oil tax question. And, you know, we've heard from um, Senate leadership that that increase in production is really going to be the solution to the fiscal challenges. And I just want to review some of the things that we've talked about in the Resources Committee for all of you, and we have um, them up on the screen. When we hear the promising news, and there's no doubt there is promising news, um, and we celebrate that promising news, um, but we have to ask three questions. You know, we don't have the luxury of just saying it's good news for Alaska. You know, we really need to understand what does that good news mean? and get down to the dollar and cents of it. So we have to ask ourselves, how much profit per, per barrel, how many barrels total, and what's the total revenue to the state? And if we look at, um, 
the new, new oil, one of the things that we've been celebrating is the 20,000 barrels per day, roughly, of new oil production on the North Slope. That's the year-over-year -year, um, average um, of new barrels. And if you look at that, you know, what that ends up meaning without going through all of the numbers, but, you know, we want to divide it between what we earn in our royalty, our ownership share, as well as what we receive from the production tax. But you'll see this 20,000 20, new barrels means about $60 million for the state. It takes a lot of new barrels to get to $2.5 billion. And so we celebrate the the good news, but we don't have the luxury of, of not asking those tough questions about what it really means, and we have to be realistic about where we're at. And just to um, drive this point home a little bit more, if we look over here, you know, you can see what 20,000 new barrels per day does for our deficit, what 50,000 new barrels per day does for our deficit, what 100,000 new barrels does a day for our deficit. It's not going to get us there. We really need to diversify. We need to consider the reasonable plan that the House Majority Coalition put forward last year. Those measures are still in the other body. They could be brought back up for consideration. Um, you know, we think it's really important that we pass House Bill 287 right now because, you know, we want the economy to grow. We want the economy to be stronger again. You know, making sure that we're educating the next generation is key to any future that we're going to have if we're going to achieve any kind of success. So we have to make that a priority. We can't let that get caught up in these games. And we really just have to remind folks of the economic reality of what these, you know, good news and announcements mean for Alaska. Um, we really have to, you know, come back to a stable fiscal plan um, that, that meets the needs for our state for the future. Thank you. And uh, as, usual, as usual, if you don't mind, give us your name and affiliation, and we'll open up for questions. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press for Representative Tarr. The expectation after passage of HB 111 last year was that a working group would come forward with recommendations mm -hmm. on how to move forward on oil taxes. Mm -hmm. And then your bill was introduced this session ahead of the working group reaching any conclusions. I guess, I guess why, why introduce that um, when the expectation was the working group would come forward? And um, do, you, do you anticipate um, any support in the Senate for this given, given kind of what was set up with HB 111 last year? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I want to be clear about what was set up with HB 111 last year. I mean, that's a, a, a review of the entire tax structure. And, you know, in my mind, that means considering things like the tax rate, the per barrel credits, any kind of incentive program, you know, what are allowable deductions, even the conversation bigger than that about whether we should go back to more of a gross tax versus, um, you know, a net profits tax or even look at, you know, changing the royalty um, amount and kind of relying on that more. So there are really many, many conversations that need to take place if we want to have a bit, you know, a, a fundamental overhaul. And that would probably take more time than we can accomplish in this session. But what we're doing with House Bill 288 is we're just looking at one piece of it, the minimum tax, the entire rest of the tax structure stays, stays the same. So it's just changing that one calculation from the 4% to the 7%, um, but, you know, keeping in place everything else. And, and it really has, um, you know, pushed us to this point because what we've heard from Senate leadership is all other options are off the table. And, you know, we, we have a math problem to solve here. And um, even if we do some kind of POMV, we know there's still a 700, or 700 million or, you know, some hundreds of millions of dollars of deficit. And so it, it's, it's time to, you know, make, make the math work and come up with the right solution. And I think that we've shown um, to be pretty reasonable when we consider these policies. We listened to industry testimony last year, and we actually scaled back some provisions. So I, I hope that our Senate colleagues will take this seriously and, and consider whether there's a, a place for this proposal in, in a bigger fiscal plan. And let me add that uh, this coalition of independents, Democrats, and Republicans came together to grow the economy and protect jobs. And we're just coming up with more options, laying more options on the table to hopefully something will stick with the Senate. Uh, Tim Bradner, Legislative Digest. For Representative Tarr, uh, where does the 20,000 barrels come from? We, we've been hearing that productions, our slow production has been flat over the past three years. Well, their um, per barrel day, you know, the average that they're saying that they increased over um, their year over average is about 20,000 barrels per day, per day. And I could get you that information if, you, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
Rich Maurer, Channel 2 News in Anchorage, Representative Sponholtz. Uh, is uh, is the contraceptives bill that you're hearing in Hess, is that um, basically Clayman's bill that he's excited about, or do other people have an interest in that as well? Uh, well, I think that Representative Clayman is pretty excited about his bill, and it's, uh, it's in rules making its way to the floor right now. I've signed on as a co-sponsor. I think, um, you know, that, uh, that anybody that uh, cares about uh, women being able to have, you know, contraceptive, you know, freedom, uh, you know, thinks that it's a good idea. We have also learned, uh, you know, uh, recently that um, there's uh, challenges in domestic violence situations with um, women not always being able to have access to contraceptive when they need it to be able to control their uh, their uh, reproduction uh, and that it's important that um, women be able to get as much of their contraceptive as quickly as possible in order to uh, ensure that they won't get pregnant when they don't intend to when they're not in a safe situation. It's a term uh, called contraceptive coercion. It's something I wasn't really uh, familiar with um, until uh, until a hearing that we did recently, but um, we expect it to move on to the onto the House floor shortly. All right, well, thank you very much. I just want to point out also that uh, we've had uh, a report that was done yesterday. Um, ConocoPhillips did a very good job in their performances last year. Uh, $652 million was uh, what they earned in the state of Alaska alone for the year 2017. In the last quarter of 2017, they had $283 million just in that one quarter, which was $50 million, and they made all in 2016. So I think it's very clear that Alaska is profitable. Alaska is competitive, um, and that we have to be careful that we're not, um, because of the generosity up here, that we're not subsidizing their operations elsewhere. We want to see that, that uh, new investment here in Alaska continue. Mm -hmm. And with that, if there's no further questions, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week.